Folks, they say two's a company and three's a crowd. So I don't know what that makes the fourth speaker on a night like this. But I'm on the program, so let's get this done. It really is an honor to stand here as a representative of so many others who have had the privilege of knowing David Gooding and learning from him. One of the things we've thought about in passing, even in the hymn we sang, was about his love for God's creation. You know, one of the places he took people to see that was along the coast road through the glens of Antrim. When I first came to Belfast, he offered to take me for a drive there, and somewhere around Tor Head, we pulled in to look out over the sun-kissed sea and the tranquil pastoral scene rising up to meet us. And as I gazed at that stunning beauty, and standing a little in awe, it has to be said, of the man beside me, I thought, what does David Gooding think about in such moments? What part of scripture is he reciting to himself just now, looking at that scene? Then he stepped up to a sheep gate, looked at the animals down below him and said, Hello, sheep. Bah! Bah! <laughs> and I suddenly knew that this man was more unique than I had ever suspected. With all of his learning, his experience, he had not lost the joy of childish fun. He was too wise to be serious all the time. And if you knew him, heard him, or even know him by reputation, you will know it's true when I say he would not have wanted to be exalted. Not when he spent his life pointing people beyond himself to the Savior he loved. But as we've also heard, he was uniquely gifted by God. I think in many ways David's own understanding of his gift and calling can be summed up in the words of John 3:27. When John the Baptist answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. And with John the Baptist, David would say, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Whatever else the Lord chooses to do with David's legacy and his teaching in years to come, the true measure of its value should continue to be judged by the same questions that he would have asked. Have I helped you to see Christ himself? Do you see him more clearly now for yourself, as K.O. has said? For that desire to see Jesus Christ rejoicing over his bride and to witness people discovering the wonders of Christ's love for themselves is what David Gooding gave David Gooding his greatest joy. And one of the many places he worked and shared that gift was in the assembly that meets at Apsley Hall. And I stand partly tonight as a representative of Apsley and the fellowship there. He joined that fellowship in 1959 when he moved to Belfast. And I don't know, but perhaps there is a special crown for remaining with one local church through its highs and lows for 60 years. He believed what Scripture says about the importance of the local church and what Christ does with it. And he tried to live that out through times when the assembly was large and thriving, times when there were hundreds attending Sunday night teaching at Apsley and Saturday Bible studies, and remaining there when numbers were small, down to a dozen or so in 2004. But right from the start of his time there and on through his later years, he was not simply an attendee, nor was he only active in the meetings of the assembly, though he was that. He shared his life with the people who gathered in that little place off the Donegal Pass. He built relationships. He served people however he could, especially with his gift for teaching God's word, but also in the way he expressed his love for others in that local body through genuine interest, through caring for practical needs, and through giving godly counsel. One member told me of a phone call David made to him after he had left, this man had left Apsley over a dispute. He said, what is this that I hear about you having left? I want you to know you are my friend, and you are missed here. And that man came back, and he's still with us at Apsley. David loved people. He loved being in their homes and welcoming them into his. And as we thought, even with that great understanding of Scripture, he didn't lord it over people, even when eventually it meant his elders were much younger than he was. 
These are my elders, he would say, with a wink and a smile in more recent years. And several years ago, on the occasion of David's 80th birthday, Reggie Dornan, who, as many of you will know, is a longtime member and was an elder for many years in Apsley, he wrote this on behalf of the assembly there. Although he is a man of great ability, recognized all around the world for his Bible teaching and for the books which he has written, David has a humble nature and a caring personal approach that no one who knows him ever feels small or uncomfortable in his presence. He happily attends diverse meetings when others, both young and old, come to teach the Word of God. Though it has to be said, I've seen more than one preacher freeze in fear when he saw him in the crowd. He sits and helps to fold the gospel newspapers, which we distribute each month to the homes in our district, and shares in the fellowship lunch before that distribution commences. He joins us at least once a year when he can on our monthly visits to a sheltered dwelling to speak to about a dozen elderly people. He even allowed the freedom of his house to a group of local mums who met for a weekly Bible study, he gave them a meal, and then sat in the firing line of all their questions. They really appreciated his Bible knowledge and down-to-earth answers. But while David's personal fellowship has been enjoyed by us all, Reggie writes, his greatest blessing has been his public contribution to our worship times and Bible teaching. When Brother David prays audibly, one is immediately lifted into the very presence of God. And during our times of remembrance in the breaking of bread meeting, he almost always prays, taking up some aspect of the theme of our meeting and expanding it to a depth and breadth which brings joy to our hearts and no doubt to the heart of our Savior. During these many years, David has been a blessing to the Apsley Fellowship. It has given us a little foretaste of what it would be like to sit in heaven and enjoy the company of God's great heroes, men like Abraham, Moses, King David, the Apostle Paul, and our David. He will surely also bring joy to the heart of the Lord Jesus. And I would add that his teaching continues to shape the fellowship at Apsley by the way we teach and think about the Bible, even influencing the way we teach children. And he has shaped our thinking about the Lord's Supper. He's leading us to a deeper appreciation of this ordinance the Lord Jesus gave to his church in all of its many aspects, including the sometimes neglected truth about the significance of the new covenant, the cup of which we drink each time we gather together. He's left a legacy. As in so many places, his teaching at Apsley brought lasting change to people's daily lives by helping us to trust what God has said and obey it out of love for the Savior. And something he said one day gave me an insight into his passion for teaching people's God's word. As we sat in my car discussing John 21, he said, do you know, it is an awe-inspiring thing to get up and try to feed the people of God if Christ is behind you. An awe-inspiring thing. He wanted to speak for Christ and say nothing Christ would not say himself so that you and I would hear Christ and come to the bridegroom for ourselves. He also taught us how important it is to tell other people about Christ. And as we've thought about, he loved it when he had such opportunities. I'll only give you one. He would tell people even who knocked on his door. When I came from the U.S. to study at Queens, he let me use a desk in a room just around the corner from the front door. And when the bell rang one afternoon, David went to answer, and I was so close I couldn't help but overhear as a young Jehovah's Witness began his pitch. After listening politely for a moment, David asked, and what do you say about Jesus Christ? For the Bible says that he is the Son of God. Uh, Well, yes, the young man said, he is a Son of God, but that doesn't make him divine. Oh, but he is, said David. John chapter 1 says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But that's not really what it says, the young man said. It's not, David replied. No, it should say a God. And then the young man uttered words I think he would live to regret. Because, sir, if you just understood the original Greek of John 1... And as I sat around the corner, the picture began to form in my mind of a very wise and gentle lion smiling down sadly on a very small mouse. And David said to him, it would not be fair of me to debate the Greek with you on this matter. But he then went on to give him several things to think about relative to the Greek definite article and the deity of Christ before they said their goodbyes. 
I hope that young man came to find better answers than the ones he had pulled out from under him that day on the doorstep. During the years I studied at Queen's and used that desk in his house, I discovered what many others before me had discovered. This man liked to stay up very late at night. And he could converse better than anyone I'd ever met. Talks ranged over philosophy, science, literature, the stars, history, art, you name it. But especially the Bible. And more often than not, the subject would lead eventually to Christ. And as he spoke about the Son of God, those of you who have talked to him will know you could see his eyes light up with joy and love over all that Christ has done. And in any of the studying or thinking I've done, small as it is, my brain has never been so stretched as it was when trying to answer his questions or follow his thinking so that I could discover for myself what he'd been leading me to see all along. Do you know there wasn't a question he was afraid of? There wasn't a subject he would avoid, but it wasn't because he was arrogant. Quite the opposite. It was because he had learned to come to God in faith and ask him his questions, and then to listen for answers in God's word. But once he had the answers, David didn't try to get people to rely on him for their answers. He actively worked against that sort of a dependency because he knew that the God who spoke his living word in the Bible is still speaking that word today and can be heard directly by those who will listen. And I'm one of very many who will be forever grateful for the way David worked to ground my faith, not in him, but in the word of Christ. But you know, that becomes all the more relevant, I think, on a day when we have, by now, said our goodbyes or are saying our goodbyes to him. It becomes more relevant to remember what the Apostle Peter quotes from Isaiah. All flesh is like grass, and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of our Lord remains forever. But here's a question. What do you do when a person who could always answer your Bible questions no longer can? What do you do when... They can't give you that counsel that you could always count on to be given. And I don't think it's wrong. Somebody said to me, and I don't think it's a wrong thing to feel on a day like today, that there's some sort of protection that's no longer there, some security that came to us because a man with his intellect and faith was on the side of God's word. Well, while that wouldn't be wrong, it would be wrong to think that somehow God's word has lost any of its living power. The word of God is still here, isn't it? The word of our Lord remains forever. And Peter goes on to say, and this is the word, this word is the good news that was preached to you. And remembering the fact that while we have a love and appreciation for this servant of God's word, it is God's plan to take his servants home after their time of service and leave the word of God to do its work among those of us who remain. But the harder question I have found over these past years lies in a different direction. Why was it that David had to wait so long and face those indignities that he did before going to be with his Lord in glory? As he often said himself, the hardest exams come at the end of the course. If you had not seen him for a few years, it might be difficult for you to imagine just how far away dementia had taken David's mind, and especially in these past two years. It went more quickly with each passing month. He didn't often read for himself even more anymore. Not even the scriptures. Not often. His mind couldn't hold on to it. And if someone maybe at this point is thinking, oh, shouldn't we really just draw a veil around all of that over those twilight years and focus on what the Lord has done through him? Well, I, I say no. For this too was part of his life's journey through a broken world. Part of what the Lord called him to go through. Just as it is even now for many of the Lord's people. And I think it's easier to understand the good things the Lord was doing in those of us who had a hand in caring for him in those years. And in that regard, it wouldn't be right if I didn't add to what's been said to record my deep appreciation for the carers who have faithfully served him these past two and a half years, for the concern and care of Barbara 
and Matthew and Stephen. And for my wife, Naomi, who has made it possible for me to be available whenever needed. And for Graham, who has shown his dedication over many years in many ways, and all the more during these recent years when his uncle was not well. Each of these people has served in countless selfless ways, and that is no doubt part of how the Lord uses such times by giving others opportunities to serve. But what good was it for David? Why did, he, why did his mind have to go? What was God doing with this servant through these last years of his life? And I have to confess, I don't know the full answer, which I think the Lord himself may by now have told David. But there are at least a couple of things we can be sure of. In the past few months, I've often read Romans 8 to David as he sat or lay in the hospital bed in his home. And that chapter reminds us that the whole creation has been groaning for a long time, and that we who know the Lord Jesus also groan as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, which is the redemption of our bodies. It also tells us that the Spirit of God helps us in our weakness, searching our hearts and interceding on our behalf for exactly the right thing to say, the right thing that each one of us needs next And that includes the circumstances of life, whether it's a period of difficulty or some space for peace and tranquility. Do we actually know what we need in order to see God's will done in our lives? We don't know what to pray for as we should, Romans 8 says. But the Spirit of God does. And He intercedes. He prays for what we need next according to the will of God. And that... Romans 8 says, is how God makes sure that for those who love God, all things work together for good. God has a very definite definite idea of what good looks like. It's the very reason he calls us. And he will make all things that happen to us serve that ultimate purpose. It is nothing less than to be conformed to the image of his Son. And since that is what God says... I have to take it that the all things that he works together for that good includes dementia and all the difficulties that David has faced over these past years and the countless other difficulties represented in this room. I don't know exactly how these processes worked and continued to shape David, but in his wisdom, our God is able to take the things that could destroy our faith and use them to make us like his son in all of his beauty. What then shall we say? Could any of the ravages of mind or spirit or body tear David or us away from God? The word of God says no. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us and nothing in all creation will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord or stop him from fulfilling his purpose of making us like Jesus Christ. In fact, he'll even use all these things to fulfill that purpose. That is the sovereignty of God for you. And I have taken it to heart as well, what Christ says about his ability to hold on to his own. Appropriately enough, that's something David taught me as well. And one day, this past August, just a couple of weeks before, maybe three weeks before he died, I asked him if I could be really cheeky and read him a sermon he had written. And he said yes. He didn't remember a lot of it by that stage, if any of it. And so I read him something from John 6, and I'll read that part of it. It's where Jesus talks about himself as the bread of life. And I read to David, Christ says, I am the living bread. When the living Christ comes to take up his residence in a human heart, That human who belongs to him will last eternally. And to enforce it, our blessed Lord said, I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And after that quotation, David went on. When it comes to these things, 
I find it profitable to do as our Lord said and adopt the attitude of a trusting child. He tells me he came down from heaven to do the will of his Father. The will of his father was that everyone who looks on the son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Forgive this personal reference, ladies and gentlemen, but unashamedly I say that I do receive Christ. I believe him to be the Son of God incarnate, truly human, truly divine. I believe and say with the Apostle Paul, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me, and I have received him as my only hope of salvation. And when I hear him saying, This is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. I picture the blessed Son of God coming to stand before the Father to introduce the redeemed, as the Bible has it, to present them before the presence of His Father with exceeding joy. And I picture the blessed Lord as He presents the redeemed to the Father, saying, Father, this is Abraham. Wonderful. Abraham, a great believer of the Old Testament. This father is King David, this is Martha and Mary, and this is Peter. What a day it will be when the risen, glorified Lord presents us before the presence of his father with exceeding joy. And when, as I imagine it, Christ has presented all the many thousands, Paul and Peter and Luther and Wesley and everybody else, and comes to the last one and is finished, then the father will say, very good, my son. But what about that chap Gooding? You haven't mentioned him. Is he here? You mean David Gooding? No, he isn't here. Why not? Didn't he trust you? Well, yes, he did, but he was a poor excuse of a thing, so I lost him. Could that ever really happen? No, my friend. The very thought is almost blasphemous. For if Christ loses one soul that has fled to him for refuge, then he shall have failed to do the will of God, and heaven itself would turn to darkness. It shall never be. He is the bread that came down from heaven, and he shall lose none that have put their faith in him. And I sing with the simple heart of the people of God, Oh, shall I be among that throng? I shall, for I have been redeemed. And when I looked up from reading that, he had that light in his eyes. And he said, That's very good. And standing there by his hospital bed in his house, I knew once again that the Lord was maintaining David's faith and that he would continue to do that, perhaps even stretching his capacity for trusting God's word in ways not possible when he had his strength of body and mind. For even when his own mind was no longer able to hold on to God's word for very long, the God of the word was holding on to him just as it must be for you and me. Through all of life's most difficult struggles and even through death's dark veil, the Son of God will lose nothing of all that the Father has given him, and he will fulfill his word and raise up David Gooding along with everyone else who has believed on the Son of God on that last day.